see one problem already. Since I'm Italian, I have to use both hands. <laughs> so I'll have to do half the speech with my left hand. Um, one of the stock items of being a public speaker is when the speaker before you is much better. Um, cut your losses and just go out. Uh, in typical fashion, Rogers changed the topics just just a little bit, but that's okay. We'll blame them later. Uh, yeah, I mean, you go with your strengths. So my original thought of what I was originally prescribed to do was to talk about the history of Fairchild's introductions of tropical fruits and nutritional plants into agriculture. So I've got a program that does part of that, but I can loop that into the history of the can palm and actually make some connections with what Louise was talking about earlier. But first, why don't we get the program and I can Cleverly called something about Fair Shop. Try that. Let's try. Yeah. No. Not careful, it just might work. That's the one. Okay. So, a couple of early comments. Number one, in a short version. It would be safe to say that Fairchild was probably the most influential person in American agriculture, period. In terms of number of introductions, the breadth of his introductions, the impact of his introductions, the impact of his work in setting up agricultural test stations, it would be almost impossible to, under to overestimate what he's done. A couple of other things. When I talk to specialty groups, and this is one of them, I'm always a little nervous that there's somebody out there that's going to say, well, you know, Craig, your taxonomy is off. Mm -hmm. DNA research indicates, okay, stop there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a horticulturist. I've been a horticulturist for 45 years. I grow plants, okay? I was a director, unwillingly, sort of. I'm not an administrator, and I'm so glad to be retired. <laughs> so with that being said, <clears throat> We want to talk a little bit about somebody who brought in food that we eat. And I want to get your mindset in the right fashion of, let's go back 120 years, 1900, more or less. And if you think about the American diet of 120 years ago, it was a plate, some sort of animal, beef, pork, chicken. If you're lucky, a root vegetable. And if you live near a metro city, maybe if you're lucky, some fruit. But rarely. That's it. The grain crops were virtually unknown. American agriculture was 1% of what it is. So somebody had to bring this stuff in. And that, I think, is the theme for the whole thing. Somebody had to bring this stuff in. And there are the two big ones. Put those together, you have an $80 billion industry crops. Now to be accurate, although Fairchild was credited with bringing in soybeans, it really wasn't Fairchild because Dorset. But Dorset worked for Fairchild. Fairchild worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. For better or for worse. You can catch that on camera, it's okay. I used to work for a solicitor of that, and I'm still recovering. So 100 years ago, well actually 130 years ago, Fairchild was hired to go find food to feed America. Well, let's go back a second. That's, that's quite a title. Find food to feed America. <laughs> Where? Answer, everywhere. Over the course of about 55 years, he visited roughly 60 countries, hired about 25 different plant collectors, and had pretty much the full weight of the U.S. Department of Agriculture to say, go forth, find it, bring it back, we'll help you with the introductions. The Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service did not exist. 
in those days. You could go anywhere you wanted to, get anything you wanted to, and bring it back. Think about that for a second. Anything you wanted, you could get it and bring it back. Oh, sorry. So, let's put it this way. We had the federal government who had some degree of foresight and saying, okay, go find food. They hired a guy who was a good botanist, a good biologist, a good scientist. He had connections. He had some very serious connections. We'll see some of those in just a bit. He had the good sense a little bit later in, in, in life to marry Alexander Graham Bell's daughter, which is good work as you can get. Um, I could try that myself sometimes, but it's really hard to do. So something else that people have to consider, though, there's the point of it there. Food security. Now consider that when Fairchild was collecting, which was roughly 1900, 1910, 1915, something happened around 1914. I sort of forget what it was. Something about conflict. The great war. Ah, that's it, the war. Thank you. World War I. Well, at that point, there really wasn't much to feed the people with. Enter a guy who brought back a few grains, really good hard shell wheat that grew in our cold, cold winters, and rice that could tolerate cold winters, and so on, and so on, and so on. We could spend a week talking about the man's introductions. Now, let me stall there for just a second. One of the disclaimers I'd like to make is I am not an expert on Dr. Fairchild. I work in his home. The camp hall was Dr. Fairchild's home not Fairchild Garden. <laughs> now, if you're really, really intellectually sharp and you add an apostrophe in an S, I work at Dr. Fairchild's Garden. Even my strange accent from a different country, nobody hears that and they go, oh, you work at Fairchild Garden. No, I don't. <laughs> I did in northern Wisconsin. Oh, you work in the garden of Miami. You work at Fairchild Garden. No, no. California, Washington State, Key West, different countries. Fairchild had a home garden in Coconut Grove. Eight acres, nice place. He liked to plant things in his backyard. We'll talk about what he did with the rest of his collections in just a minute. But to touch on the camp palm for just a moment. Campong essentially translates as to a Malaysian word for compound. Walled in community, multiple homes, something to keep out the goats and pigs, or the Huns, if you live in Coconut Grove. And in that compound are multiple homes, multiple families, fish ponds, vegetable farms, rice paddy, and so forth. <coughs> Having been to some of them in Indonesia, they're pretty cool. In this case, it's just eight acres. It's 150 feet wide and 1,800 feet long, right on Biscayne Bay. So, a very cool place, high altitude, 17 feet above sea level. <laughs> Nosebleeds, high altitude, <laughs> bags, you know, the whole works. He saw it in 1915, 16, his wife saw it and said, we got to have it. We'll touch on that in just a minute. But this man collected like crazy. So there are collectors and there's collectors. Fairchild collected a lot. And I want to come touch back to what Maurice was talking about just a little while ago. Going to the markets is a cool thing. And Fairchild has this great reputation of being a swashbuckling field collector. Nope. He walked through the markets and said, get some of that, some of that, get some of that, some of that. Some of that. Try that. What does it taste like? I don't know, give it a shot. <laughs> and in the immortal words of Chris Rollins, everything's edible once. <laughs> I'll be back in a week if you can still walk. <laughs> okay, so Fairchild was the big honcho. He oversaw everybody. The guy that really gets under credit is Frank Meyer, Meyer Lemons, amongst other things. If you dig back into the archives, Frank Meyer probably collected 3,000 different species of plants from about 20 countries. 
most of which don't go here. He spent a lot of his time in temperate, almost sub-Arctic areas, Russia, Northern uh, Europe, and so on. But the credit goes to a lot of the other places in this country where you see those plants. And Hugo Curran did a fair bit of work collecting on multiple Indonesian expeditions. These are three of about 20 different people. So somebody had to bring it in, somebody had to go to that country. This sounds familiar? Steve Brady? Somebody had to bring it back. You had to grow it, research it, test it, see if it lives here, see if it grows and fruits here, distribute it, and so on. That started 140 years ago. So I also would have to admit, I'm not a great PowerPoint creator, my apologies. I used to be when I had staff. <laughs> but Fairchild established the Office of Seed and Plant Introductions, the earliest precursor to essentially the USDA plant research stations. Did I say something? No. Yes. <laughs> you just had that. <laughs> so the OSPI was pretty much given carte blanche to bring in anything from anywhere. And my biggest curiosity when I heard this about 45 years ago was that's terrific. It came in through where? And went where? Well, smart guy. He put together several research stations that handled that problem. Oops, let's back up one. It was tasked with the introduce trial, evaluate, improve, distribute new plants for American agriculture. Oh, that's not a big job. Bring in everything, test it, see if it works, hand it out to agronomists. The author of the book, we'll see in just a little bit, said that Fairchild brought in the primary colors of agriculture and let the agronomists continue to finish the picture. Which is a really good way to put it. Fairchild did, wasn't the first guy to bring rice into this country. Somebody did that 600 years ago. But he was the guy that brought in the varieties that produced the most. So with that being said, if you think about it, by and large, about one out of every 12 things that you're likely to eat came through this guy. I probably should end the program there, because that's really where it ends. But the new introductions would serve as germplasm banks for future generations. They had no idea about germplasm banking. But it worked out that way. OK, here's a few. This is a smattering of what Fairchild brought in. This is like one-tenth of one percent. And if you take a look at it, if you take a look just a group, we'll just take oh, it's avocados. I assure you, he was not the first person to bring avocados into the country. But he found the best avocados in Mexico and said, how about we could bring back 50 scions of that one, 50 of that, 60 of that, 100 of that, 50 of that, and 100 of that. He's credited with numbers as high as 200,000 introductions. If you dig into the archives a bit, it might have been, just as I mentioned, 50 of this, 50 of that. OK, you can go into this garden and find 20,000 introductions if you take 20,000 cuttings. And if you want to do that, I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> Bigger groups. And he does not. There's some 25 different varieties of Andy Desmos in this state. Okay, or Arsenius. I brought some seedlings in case somebody wants to take some home. Pears, cherries, apricots, plums, almonds, grapes, quinoa, and peaches came through Meyer and Fairchild. Fairchild discovered, or at least brought back, came off for the marginal benefit of this country. Apples, Dorset, Meyer, persimmons. Again, a dubious benefit. <laughs> I've never been fond of them. Fairchild brought back some of the best date varieties. He brought back 30 date varieties from Iraq in 1905. Those palms are still producing in the El Cajon. So there's something like 300 varieties of dates. He brought back 10% of them, and they're still producing. So within roughly 120 years, we've gone from zero to production to a commonplace commodity. That's not, not bad. 
And I've mentioned this, I've shown this slide because that is a picture of the Chapman Field Research Station growing facility, circa 1915. This is a more modern USDA research greenhouse in Fort Pierce. The same organization, completely different time styles. But oddly enough, that slab house could still grow some nice plants. Now here's where the interesting part gets more diverse. Fairchild set into place, along with the guy named Swingle, who we all know from, cir from Citrus, a number of plant introduction stations so that wherever Fairchild went, from whatever climate, he'd have some place to park the plants. Hmm. From some very cold areas, mainly potatoes in Sturgeon Bay, not far from my hometown of Milwaukee right there, but up in here in Geneva, New York, all temperate, more, less temperate, hot and dry, very hot and dry. My God, why am I here dry? <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing here dry? <laughs> Miami, cut through the mosquitoes with a mop with a knife. My name was Puerto Rico and Hilo. So that is about as diverse a bunch of stations as you're going to get. So that no matter where he went, whether it was from Russia, from Northern China, Southern China, India, Pakistan, Ceylon, Indonesia, whatever, he'd have some place to find, put these plants into place. Not bad. What he did with them after that is kind of up for grabs because he really didn't have much interest to tend to them. There was just too many. His interest was to get them, go to the places, get the plants, bring them in, parcel them out, my job is done. Yeah. Now, going back to something that Maurice was talking about earlier, and she could speak to this with much greater expertise than I, <coughs> one of his greatest searches was for a fibrous mango. He found a bunch of them. Now, again, with this group, I can't really cite numbers with great certainty, but my understanding is there's about 250 varieties of mangoes alive at the Chapman Field Research Station in Miami. Probably half of those are from Fairchild's introductions. The trees are alive, that's all they are. I don't know if you've ever visited that station, their job is to keep the trees alive. <coughs> and I, I think barely alive might be accurate, but they, that's their job, to keep them alive. So between the USDA and Chapman Field, which in Miami and Puerto Rico, there's a lot of mango variety. He wanted to find out avocado varieties that would do well for the wet climate of southeastern Florida. He found some of those from the West Indies. He was experimenting with different garcinias, which turned out to be a major failure. They didn't like our climate a bit. Incredibly slow. But boy, some of them had great fruit. Andy Desmogonius produced the fruit by the bucket. There are seven big trees of Andy Desmond's at the camp home. I oversaw them for years. What a beautiful, wonderful tree for someone else to grow. <laughs> An ideal for a golf course <laughs> or a park, somewhere away from humans. <laughs> they produce tens of thousands of fruit that can be beautiful, tasty, and slippery in that order. <laughs> Gorgeous tree would see fruit. I'll show you a picture of it shortly. And one of the things that fascinated Fairchild was that Andy Desmond fruit had a really interesting character about them in that, right, correct me where I'm wrong, about 90% of the people find the fruit to be sweet, and 10% of the people find the fruit to be bitter. And there's nothing in between the two. It's either one or the other. And he was absolutely fascinated. To, add, to find out why. <clears throat> makes an outstanding jam. And there are reports that it makes a very good wine. But the problem is that 90% of the people would find the jam sweet, 10% of the people would find the jam bitter and unpalatable. Therefore, unmarketable. But then it produces fruit like crazy. It's a little hard to market, it's fairly fragile, but it's really quite something. And when it's in fruit, it's, a, it's an amazing 
visitor for you say people say can I have some take all of it <laughs> here's a clipper and a bag and a bushel and a basket and some hand sanitizer Low plots and a parish of uh, several low plot varieties for Seneca was noted for one of them. There are still some citrus at the Ken Hall that were planted in 1945. They're still alive. I think they're bonsai. I don't think they've moved more than a foot in the 75 years. I don't know how many is, but they're still alive. They've resisted all the government influences. Was, was that politically correct? <laughs> all the political influences about citrus? and all the bugs and all the diseases and so forth. So if you want to taste some heritage citrus, head out over the Kempong. They're fruiting right about now. Uh, there's a neighbor on the northern property that's really quite something. It grows in bone dry soil. It has a very tasty little mandarin fruit about that size. It was planted in 1950. It's about seven feet tall. Don't know whether it's grafted or not, but it's a hell of an interesting fruit. Lynchies, which uh, didn't do as well as we hoped. And many of those are still growing at Chapman Field or at the Ken Hall. There's about 12, almost 1,400 species growing at the Ken Hall. That's Andy Desma. And it doesn't really show to great effect the very dark fruit. Those are the sweetest ones. Every branch tip would have four or five or six or eight clusters of fruit. And this tree grows like crazy. I just heard earlier today from Matt and Nick at the Garden Care that uh, the, the seedling had come up here. In the 30 years I've known the camp mall, I've never seen seedlings come up in any of the seven trees. Which makes me wonder why. And just to go through a few photos of some of the things he's brought in, again, this is a group that knows many of these things. One of Fairchild's lesser successful experiments was introducing figs into South Florida. Neat idea, humidity got, got the better of the plants because they developed rust fungus and a lot of insect problems. They didn't thrive, there were nematode problems. Um, heat in the wintertime, air and rain in the wintertime. Other than that, very successful. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave up on the idea of figs in South Florida sent them off to Southern California, and now you have these. Now, garcinias. Personally, as an ornamental, I think garcinias have a lot of potential. They're very pretty trees when they're happy. It just takes a while to make them happy. Uh, Garcinia spicata makes a very, very good landscape plant. It grows perfectly well on the beach side, salt tolerant completely, hurricane tolerant completely. Grows about one inch every 27 years. <laughs> if you can afford them, get them at full size. I love it when the landscapers put them in about this tall. Say, oh, they'll be up to about here in 2088. <laughs> really slow. But the one on the left is Garcinia Livingstonia, and the one on the right is Garcinia Madrono. Uh, this has been, these two have been some of the most popular fruit the guests of the camp hall. Forgive me if I change over from we to us to them. I've only been retired for two months. It takes a while to be settled. My own favorite, I'll just come back here, is Garcinia Madrono. Uh, that's my hand in the background there. The fruit are about the size of a golf ball. And boy, are they tasty. Very, very sweet. Uh, nice acid over our undertone. Just don't get the sap of the rind on your clothes. It doesn't come out, trust me, on that one. But many of the school groups that have been through there harvest these things, and the Madrono that was at the camp hall was maybe 15 feet by 15 feet would produce about 100 pounds of fruit. It is absolutely encrusted with fruit. So I have seedlings here. There's three pots of Madronos and three pots of Livingstonii. They don't do, they don't mind the rocky, calcareous soil. They don't need much fertilizer. No nutritional problems, no bug problems. They've been through 10 hurricanes, not a problem. Again, slow. Um, do you see, how many different words are there for slow? Perversely <laughs> slow, insanely slow, 
you might get a foot of growth per year out of them, but it's worth the win. Particularly that one. Uh, strangely enough, when I left the garden two months ago, I thought, I'll just get some of the images that I took. I took about 7,000 pictures at the camp home of different fruits and flowers and different things, different parts of stages, different projects. I wanted to get a picture of this Madromo for this program. All of my pictures have been removed from my laptop and stored someplace else. Oh boy. <laughs> I typed in a picture, I typed in a request for a city Madrono, what pops up? Facebook. It does look familiar. Yeah, that's my hand. Yeah. <laughs> that's my wristwatch right there. <laughs> and this was a picture I sent off to uh, social media because it, one of the cool things about the camp long, at least in my administration, Fruits on the ground, it's all yours. We just try to ask people, sorry, they try to ask people to stay off the trees because the trees aren't sturdy enough to have people climb them. But you know, informally, if you could reach it, is go ahead. People were a little suspicious about this one. After they tried it, 10 or 12 or 15 years later, it went that great. Loved ones, I don't know how they are on this coast or the east coast. In the 36 years I've been in Miami, production on the trees has steadily dropped as it gets warmer and warmer and warmer and warmer. Now, in the odd event that there are real estate lawyers, developers here in the crowd, I will not say why the climate is changing, but I think we can agree it has changed. It tends to be warmer, rain when it should be, Periodicity between heat and cold in the wintertime is getting worse. It stays warmer later in the year. Not good for robots. I'm not sure how it is over here, but uh, you'd have to go up to almost Gainesville to find good production on robots. And here's one of Fairchild's big successes, the Durham wheat. Most of the wheat came from the southern Ukraine, like the slightly more temperate winter. He tried to find one that tolerated the Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri winter. That's the one. Roughly 1912, in comes Durham wheat, handed it off to the people in Ames, Iowa. They propagated it like crazy. Why not? One of the great success stories of a planted producer, Durham wheat. Okay, Citron from Corsica. Not sure if that's commercially grown anywhere in this country. Matt, wherever you are. And is there a possibility that this is grown commercially here? Definitely not on a, I don't think on a commercial scale. Yeah. Okay. Does it grow here at all? Try to, try to contain your excitement. <laughs> <laughs> Outside of some, some obvious, you know, probably not, not easy to find in my country, on <laughs> my side of the state. But the one that is that we have a delight with Meyer lemons, and again, I remember growing Meyer lemons at my house in South Miami back in the middle 80s, and it grew beautifully. It set fruit just fine. Year after year after year after year, the production dropped. The tree faltered even though it was containerized. It got warmer and warmer and warmer in the winter. I gave the tree to a friend in West Palm, Production went back up. It got warmer there. She gave the tree to a friend in Orlando. Production went up. Okay? Cooler winters, better lemons. There you go. Okay, I can't touch the pictures that Marie's had <laughs> in terms of the diversity of mangoes. Fairchild did exactly what Marie's did as well. Go to the markets. Go, let's try that one and that one and that one. I don't think he was as careful as she was. Here's a picture of this one, what do you call it? He just grabbed buckets and baskets and everything, send them back to USDA. I think the idea was to get something into agricultural production that was fiberless, productive, and so on. Now, Maurice mentioned something interesting about Mrs. Hayden and possibly the original Hayden tree, which is about eight blocks down the road from the camp home. A nice connection between Mrs. Hayden and the Cannonball is that Dr. Fairchild knew Mrs. Hayden. And Mrs. Hayden loaned Fairchild her gardener, Sands, Ernest Sands. 
who then went on to become the gardener of the Turkmen at the Kampong for decades, along with a guy named Sinnons. So if you happen to know avocados, Sinnons and Sands did all the gardening of the Kampong. And the pictures of the old days are fairly depressing. I mean, the Kampong was a flat coral trek. A few scrub pine trees, some wire grass, a few sable palms, a few sable palmettos. That's it. I'll show you a few pictures of what it looks like today. So here's where it gets interesting. How many things did he bring in? I've heard estimates from 7,000 to 200,000. I think the truth in there is probably closer to 10,000. We could accredit to him personally. Probably two-thirds of it would be to his collectors. And we don't even really know what constitutes an accession. But the 200,000, the 75,000 number is accredited to a USDA researcher. The most authoritative researcher that I know of on David Fairchild was Bert Zuckerman. Now, I give you a fair warning, some shameless marketing coming up right now. The book of the Can Bomb. Available for sale. There you go. <laughs> Circa 18, from 1860 to about 1994 is contained in there. So if we look at a 55 year, 50, 55 year career in agriculture, that's not bad shooting. No other collector comes even close, not even by a magnitude. So we don't know how many was introduced by each collector. USDA files are very hard to get into. I've been trying to do this for 20 years at Chapman Field. All they can point me to is a shelf about four feet long of books that Fairchild wrote. I said, where are the archives? You'd have to go to Washington. Forget it. Okay. Now, Maurice had some great pictures of collecting out in the wild forest. This is how Fairchild collected stuff. This is nice work if you can get it. First of all, you get a wealthy benefactor, Allison Armour, uh, <clears throat> Armour Meats and so on, Chicago, extremely wealthy, very good about being a benefactor, philanthropist. He had a little boat, called the Utawana, um, I don't know, 150 feet long. Not a bad way to collect plants. This is in Gambia, 1925. Uh, there's a Hard, very difficult to beat this style of plant collecting. But Armour funded a lot of Fairchild's expeditions, and Fairchild was able to collect a huge number of plants, bring them back through to Miami or through uh, Washington. No permits, no problems. Uh, oh, sorry. The most famous of his expeditions is the Chain Ho. Now, again, we're talking about a very wealthy benefactor, Anne Archbold, uh, of the standard royal fortune. Got in good shape, good, good friendship with David Fairchild. Built this boat from zero. Pay his specifications for sailing around Indonesia, specifically the Malacca Islands, the Chang Ho. And inside was air conditioned laboratories, collecting tables, quarters, and so forth. Again, not a bad way to do business. He was sailing around in 1940 in the northern Moluccas. The admiral of the area caught up with him and said, Fairchild, you really need to leave now. Well, I'm almost done collecting. No, you need to really leave now. The Japanese Navy is just there. And they're heading our way. They're in the war mode, and you are sailing on Chinese junk. Okay, so Fairchild booked the other way, but did a few more items worth collecting on the way out. So I have to admire his dedication. But uh, I finished that trip. It was supposed to be two years. I think it ended up being about one. Now, going back to what we were talking about at the beginning, he collected tons of samples. And I happen to like this picture a lot. This is off the, in the Andres, uh, some uh, those are the fruits of a palm tree, Calyptrocalyx staccatus, 
Castilian fluorescence draped around his neck. That island in back of him is one I visited with Dr. Fairchild's staff in 2016 as we recreated that same trip. So we had a chance with uh, Carl Lewis and his staff to go to the same islands, the same bays, and the same villages 75 years later. Pretty cool. And we took a zodiac into some of these little villages and we thought, wow, they haven't changed in all these years. And it was all this old mud brown and gray. And then you saw the satellite dish. <laughs> and the kids came out, every one of them came out from school wearing emirates t-shirts. <laughs> there goes the idea. But nonetheless, at some point, they had to get from there back to here. And they were all mailed. And in the oldest days, they were mailed on steamships. In the newer days, it was Hannah and Clipper. Nowadays, it's point, click, and FedEx. So again, I just wanted to kind of bring to your mindset, somebody had to go get them. Somebody had to get them here in a time when it was not convenient to do so at all. So the ancestry of a whole lot of our food plants comes through this guy. It came to here, the Canton, where I had the great fortune to work for six years. Quick Harkening back to 1985, I was a student at the other garden, Fairchild, for, as a, for a summer. I think they've recovered by now. I was taken over here to the camp home, and I had the first mango of my entire life here. Larry Schachman, who I imagine many of you know, introduced me to my first mango, but he did it, as he said, backwards. His normal sequence was to give you a Tommy Atkins, and then maybe a Haiti, and then something in the middle, like Cambodiana, and then at the end, carry. Okay. Nope, backwards. First thing he gave us, carry. That's a pretty tasty mango. After that, everything is bad. <laughs> That's like, you know, the first fresh fish I ever had in Florida was grilled dolphin. If that's the first thing you've ever had in Florida, everything else, you're stuck. You're sunk. Nothing else compares. So, yeah, um, that carry is still there, along with a bunch of other trees, some of which are over 100 years old. So, if you want to taste what heritage mangoes taste like, head over to the camp while I'm right about now. They'd be more than happy to provide you with the mangoes. We have plenty of them. Some of which I would love to know why he collected it. There's one called Oh Kong Kong. The squirrels don't eat it. <laughs> and I was like, David, what were you thinking? Now there's another one there that grows right next to the driveway. Nothing eats it. Ants don't eat it. What is useful about this blend? Now one of the interesting questions I got as a director is when people would say, if you don't like the tree, why don't you just get rid of it? It's not my job. My job was to keep everything alive and extant. If you're curating an art collection at the Smithsonian, if you don't like it, you don't get the chop the chance to get rid of it. God knows I wish I could. Now, with that being said, some of those varieties that are perfectly dreadful could have other things grafted onto them, which brings me to Crafton Cliff, who has more knowledge of the Campong's fruit trees than anybody I know. Therefore, should you have any questions about what I've said, ask him. <laughs> Now, just as a humorous note, right after I left the camp hall, I got a message on my email because the phone system at the camp hall was a variety called Ring Central. It takes messages, turns it into an email, voice to text, sends you an email of what the computer thinks that the caller said. <laughs> Nobody's programmed this thing to speak English, I think. So I got an email from Crap and Cliff. <laughs> from the Naval Satanic Guard. <laughs> I didn't know the Navy had a Satanic <laughs> It took me about two seconds to figure out it was crap and clip. Asking me to come and speak here. So here I am at the Naval Satanic Guard. <laughs> <laughs> the Camp Hong has been there for 140 years plus. I mean, actually, the site has been there since about 1850 but actively in cultivation of one way or another since about 1870. Fairchild bought it in 1916. Pretty much ended his 
professional career there in 1945, died in 54. This is the interest I went through every day. That vein injury right there was planted in 1924. Now this crowd understands pain and treatment. A lot of the tourists there don't. So people would come in and go, wow, that's a huge tree. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> they get so much bigger than that. But I've been a horticulture since I was 15. And my whole viewpoint of horticulture has changed. I, I was mostly orchid addict. I'm reformed now. <laughs> I was a plantaholic, I reformed. And the best way to do that is to become an administrator of a botanical garden. <laughs> Your whole viewpoint changes. Every plant now you look at it and go, hmm, where am I going to put that? How long is it going to take to grow? How much effort do I have to spend to maintain it? And the Reeves had that wonderful picture of that mango tree about this high. Oh, I would love to do that. Just <laughs> right across the top. Unfortunately, some of the government laws prevent you from doing that. It's called hat bagging, even in an agricultural environment. But it can be done over a period of time, and I think that's an important point that should be done. Not here. This is what the, pal the palace looked like wow. in 1930. Austere would be a good way to put it. It would be safe to say that although Fairchild had great taste in buildings. He had several homes in Chevy Chase, Maryland, uh, another one in Nova Scotia. Uh, I would say he was not prone to architectural excess. That's the way it looks today. A little different. Now, of particular interest, for those of you who are palm people, this type of sperm, there's one here, there's one off screen here, and there's one just peeking out right there. Tigospermum macarthuri. Those are the first ones introduced into this country in 1939. So virtually every type of sperm macarthur palm that has ever been produced more or less came from those plants. If you take another step upward, the other 99% of the plants that he collected that stayed in his public collections went to Fairchild Garden, where they're still on display. There are lots of records at Fairchild Tropical Garden that date back to 1938, 39, 40, 41, then through into the 50s. There was a skip after that, and then things changed a bit. But that's what the Canton looks like of about six months ago. It is diverse. Now, I have a real soft spot for the place. I've known it for 35 years. To give you a quick insight, I read one of Dr. Fairchild's books when I was 14 in Wisconsin. <laughs> I still have that copy of that book. It was written at the Cam Long, and I ended up being the director of it. Not bad. Boring, but not bad. <laughs> it tells you I've done nothing else in my life <laughs> except horticulture in one venue or another. So for those of you who have real lives, I appreciate that. This is Dr. Fairchild's man cave, but it looks a heck of a lot better than it did in his day. It's a very austere, he had very few tools. We've had several botanists in this, in this office. No botanist would ever have an office that organized or that clean. There would be plant samples everywhere. The tools would be in great big buckets on the floor. <laughs> this packing table is still original. That desk is still original. Those plant presses came from Wellesley about six years ago the guy who did all of this. Let's see if I have a picture of him. A guy named Mark Dion, who does museum rooms all over the world. He was hired to do this with a big grant. He did a beautiful job. It took him three years to acquire all this stuff and three days to set it up. This is upstairs from the Gulf Simmons Laboratory. And the rest of it, the roof and the lights and so forth, are original to 1926. So I think it has the authentic 1926 smell. You walk in and go, ew. <laughs> Most people do. We just imported the smell. So Fairchild would go outside, find the latest mango or garcinia or whatever else he brought in, pack it up on that table, 
put it on that scale, wrap it with that paper, tighten it up with that tape, send it off to Washington, good politician that he was, send it off to his favorite friends at the Agriculture Department. I think we need some money to test this. Let's go to some more of it. It works. Sometimes. Most of the time, he just wanted to keep his name in the hat. So usually, he would pick the best looking mangoes and send five or six to the Department of the Interior, the Secretary of Agriculture. Just to keep, you know, usually in February, mm -hmm. and if he could, March, April, if they were early, just to keep his name in the ring. That's probably the best book that's based on fact. Unfortunately, it ends a little early in Fairchild's career. Uh, this goes up to about 1920, 1822. Uh, I met Daniel Stone on a couple of occasions. It's pretty accurate. And I think the title, The Food Explorer, was about as accurate as you get, because it does give you some insight as to how far reaching Fairchild's exploits were. And if you put the pins in the net, he was pretty much all over. So we hear a lot about farm and table. Let's take it three magnitudes larger. How about from Borneo to Miami to a farm to your table? So you know, people talk about farm and table. Oh, it came from the farm in Lewiston. How about the farm in Borneo? So Maurice had the right idea. There's some interesting plants out there. Fairchild found a bunch of them. They're still ongoing. Maurice proved that too. They're still ongoing, but not quite to that magnitude because of <laughs> law. Does anybody here work for USDA? Yeah, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Should have asked that up front. <laughs> <laughs> that is the view I used to get every day at the end of the day, looking east of the bay for that area. Thank you for your attention. 